and I'm going to invite Megan Lee Devlin, who is the Chief Executive of the Central Digital and Data Office, up on stage. Thanks, Megan. Thank you very, very much, and good morning, everyone. I feel compelled to start by admitting that I have seen Barbie, as you might expect. Um, and I wanted to understand a little bit about our audience here today before I jump in. So uh, first of all, have you seen Barbie? Uh, good. Uh, second of all, um, are you part of the DDAT function? Couple, yeah, good, fantastic. Uh, are you part of the analysis function? Quite a few as well, excellent. Are you part of the policy function? And then if you haven't had a chance to put your hand up, you know, please do so now just for inclusion purposes. Excellent. Good to have uh, you all with us this morning. So I'm Megan Lee Devlin. I'm the Chief Executive of the Central Digital and Data Office. Uh, based in the Cabinet Office, uh, we lead the DDAP function for government. Um, and I, I want to talk about, I'll talk about a few things this morning, but I want you to leave with three things. The first is some new ideas based on the innovative work that we're seeing across government. Uh, the second is a wider aperture of a sort of changed understanding about data being all about analysis, statistics, and insights, to being it about the lifeblood of our public services. And I want to bring that to life with a few examples of where we are using and sharing data really effectively across government. And finally, some practical resources developed by my team here in CDDO uh, that you can use to ensure that you're using data safely and securely in your work day to day. Uh, but first of all, let me spend a little bit of time explaining what my organization does. So CDDO sits in the cabinet office, as I mentioned, and leads the DDAP function. We're sort of the HQ of uh, digital data and technology. Small team that's focused on three things. The first is around setting strategic direction for us as government, uh, working closely with permanent secretaries and leaders to set uh, the ambition and vision for what we want to achieve and the standards that will help us to achieve that. Uh, the second is around convening colleagues across departments. So uh, if you're in central government, you're chief technology officer, chief data officer, uh, and uh, KU within the digital function will join many of our forums, and you may yourself be part of one of our communities of practice. And the third is that we're very focused on building digital skills at scale across government, which is why uh, today is so important, but we do lots of educational programs working closely with CSHR, uh, primarily focused around our leaders, making sure our leaders have the right uh, digital literacy and understand how they can use digital data and technology effectively in their organizations. It's great to hear Simon and Alison's com conversation on how uh, we can really become the world leading civil service in the use of our data. And those points speak very, very closely to, uh, to my heart, to what we do in CDDO, and what we're trying to achieve along with our partners across government and across arms length bodies. And that collective vision that we've set out is that by 2025, we want to be a more digital in government, a transformed digital government that delivers better outcomes for everyone. Bit wishy-washy, I'll give, you, I'll give you that. So let me explain what I mean when I say digital government. What does it look and feel like? Well, it looks like each and every policy decision that we made, we make is based on deep insight and evaluated continuously through data. It looks like our frontline workers having access in the same way that Simon articulated our, our NHS colleagues have, uh, with powerful tools at their fingertips that help them to make real-time decisions based on technology and data and deliver the best outcomes they can at that possible time for the public. And it means where it's safe and appropriate to do so, we're using AI to become more efficient and more accurate in the way that we deliver our public services. And I'll come on to what we're doing in that space in a moment. Uh, so we have many pockets of brilliance across government in terms of our digital services, in terms of really cutting edge technology, and in terms of our use of data um, that really bring to life that ambition we have to be a digital government. And I'm going to share with you a couple of my favorites. And these uh, two instances are winners of the Civil Service Data Challenge, which is an annual competition we lead in CDDO that brings together cross-functional teams across departments to solve some of our most important challenges bet by better using data. This year, the winning team were a cross-functional team of colleagues from home office, from across the police uh, organizations, and other parts of government, who set out to identify a way to tackle modern slavery through better using data. And what the team did was patch together lots of different data sources from different government departments, from the police force, but also open source data, to identify where several different risk factors combine and, the, and to, to shed light on the locations and the organizations most at risk of, of modern slavery. 
And what that helped us to do as government is double down and make sure that the police could focus their investigations and their resources on the locations and the organizations where we thought they were, that were most at risk. So really powerful insights that helped us to focus our, our time and resources and achieve better outcomes for the public. Last year, uh, the winning team was tackling a different challenge for us along the lines of net zero. Uh, and they were using AI to identify drains in peatlands using aerial photography. And that helped us in, improve the speed and reduce the cost of identifying where those peatlands needed to be remediated, uh, which is absolutely in support of our net zero plans and was a, a brilliant use case of AI at a time when, unlike now, we weren't talking about AI every day. So these are some really obvious use cases of using analytical data to reach a better decision for the purposes of analysis, insights, and statistics. But what is the role that data plays in the lifeblood of our public services? This is what I care really passionately about. And to support our business operations, the way that we work as government and deliver uh, the services and policy that we do. So if we just take one of the many services that government uh, provides, of which there are about 7,000 across central government departments, and one related to Simon's example of COVID, which was the NHS COVID app. This is a great example of innovative digital delivery. It was stood up by a team in six weeks. Uh, it was downloaded over 31 million times. It was the second most downloaded app in 2020. It helped to avert 1 million cases of COVID-19, which translates into around 44,000 hospitalizations and 9,000 deaths. I think that really quite a substantial, or really sort of fundamentally humbling number, 9,000 deaths. Um, and I think whilst the app is a digital service and it's supported by mobile app technologies, and many of you may uh, be involved in building government apps, what's it got to do with data? Well, the app is a tool for data collection. It's fundamentally, its value is in creating a data exchange between different organizations and, and inputs and providing those data outputs through interpretation of that data to deliver better outcomes for the public. And this is where the greatest possible value can be extracted for government departments is through better public services delivered through more streamlined data sharing. That I fundamentally believe. Let me share with you another example, one login for government. Many of you will be familiar with this service which is being led by our friends in the government digital service. Um, and it enables people to really simply and easily access government services. I don't know if you've ever looked at your settings on your phone and, and scrolled down through the number of passwords you have on gov.uk. Uh, you'll hear from my accent that I'm not originally Australian, so I've interacted very, uh, um, not originally British, so I've interacted a lot with the Home Office services. So I have several different logins, so I encourage you to do it and have a look. And one login for government is tackling that by creating a single approach through which we can log into all of our government services. Now that, you may say, is a digital service, or you may say that's an interesting technology, but I say that's all about data. At its heart, it's about data exchange. It's about sharing data more seamlessly through departments, safely and securely, so that a user doesn't need to give us the same data again and again when they interact on gov.uk with different organizations and departments. So that's about fixing the plumbing, the data plumbing that underpins our services so the public can have a more seamless experience of accessing what they need. And it's only possible through th three things, high quality data, accessible data, and responsible data sharing. So we all know and experience the benefits of using great data. Those of you in the an analysis function will know uh, what incredible insight can do in terms of changing our policy direction. Those of you delivering those sorts of public services know the importance of getting that data exchange right. But as an organization as large and complex as civil service, and with data as important and as crucial to lives and livelihoods as we hold, there are really inevitable challenges to, to building data-powered services in a culture that encourages and incentivizes data sharing. And I, I think about those challenges in terms of three things discoverability, quality, and risk for data sharing. You may know, or I, I, I would hesitate a guess that you all know, it can be very difficult to discover data in government, to know where it is, who owns it, uh, which data is most valuable and useful, and how we can extract it from our systems, which very often are quite old and can often be legacy systems. The second challenge around quality is that often the usefulness of our data isn't as, isn't as strong as it could be. We run into issues around poor data quality, lack of interoperability, lack of standardization. And then the third around data sharing 
is our, our rich data sets hold huge value to government and often are highly sensitive and personal to individuals and therefore, of course, we need to share our data safely and securely with the right safeguards in place. But that can be tricky and really difficult to work through. But the good news is these challenges are not insurmountable and uh, I'm sure you are resolving them in, in your organizations day to day, but there are some really clear blueprints used across government um, applied daily in all departments to make sure we can overcome these blockers together. And let me share with you just three tools that you might, you might find helpful in terms of day-to-day -day work that can tackle these challenges at a local level. The first is the data sharing governance framework. Now this framework helps to create proactive, simple, and faster mechanisms for data sharing by setting out the principles to follow, really clear practical guardrails that can enable you to make sure that you're sharing in a safe and ethical way. And those principles are around committing to accountability and what that looks like, making it easier to start sharing of data in the first place, maximizing the value of data that you, sh that you hold in terms of quality and consistency, supporting responsible data sharing between organizations, and making your data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. The second tool is a data ethics framework that helps make use of your data by making it transparent, your use of data transparent, accountable, and fair. Transparency is around making sure your access, your actions, processes, and data are open to inspection. And really transparent so that people understand how you are extracting data, using data, and, and can understand those underpinnings. The second around accountability is making sure you have effective governance and oversight mechanisms in place to manage that data responsibly. And finally, fairness. You eliminate the potential uh, as we heard from Alison and, and Simon, for data to have unintended discriminatory effects um, on individuals or social groups. So that ethics framework is on gov.uk. All of these tools are on gov.uk and are shared through the Central Digital and Data Office to make sure that you don't need to solve these problems again and again in your departments. We've, we've looked at the challenges. We've set out some really helpful guardrails and principles. Do use them and... Uh, and I hope you find them valuable. And finally, the data maturity assessment for government. And I can actually see in the audience uh, Kathleen, who leads on this work for us. So, uh, the data maturity assessment for government uh, is a collaboration with ONS, and it helps you to understand your organization's capabilities when it comes to data and your readiness to share and use data. And it helps you to identify areas where your team or your organization might have weak spots and like to strengthen your uh, data skills, capabilities, your, uh, the systems you use to create and store data and the management and protection practices that you're following. And I appreciate that not all of these concepts are really exciting, juicy data constructs, but they are so crucial because of the role that we play and because of the data that we hold. And when we see these tools applied, really great things happen. For example, the Warm Home Discount Scheme. Uh, which now, because of better data sharing between DWP and other departments and energy companies, means that we can undertake responsibly and ethically, of course, under the parameters set out by the Digital Economy Act, we can better target households in fuel poverty and provide rebates automatically to those people, which means that we lessened the impact of the cost of living crisis over the winter, automatically providing rebates simply through better sharing of data. So those are the tools that exist already, do use them, and there are so many more. But there is much more to come from CDDO to help tackle those three challenges that I set out. As part of the 2025 roadmap, which is the strategy for the digital data and technology function across government to 2025, we focus on three, those three surmountable challenges, data quality, data discoverability, and data sharing. To aid in these, we're creating a data marketplace for government. Due to be launched later this year, currently in beta, your teams may be uh, involved in its development. And that marketplace is a single place where you can discover, access, and share data assets that are deemed to be our most important to be shared across government for operational purposes in an ethical, tr legal, and trusted way. We're running Data Connect 2023. I hope you've all signed up. We've had 9,000 registrations this year, um, which enables civil servants of all grades uh, to sign up to a variety of sessions of sh showcasing great uh, data innovations, um, showcasing data policy and data management developments, and sharing technical best practice around use it, of AI in government in particular. About a third of the sessions are focused on AI this year. 
We're helping to encourage data innovation through the likes of the Data Challenge. If you've not been previously involved in the Data Challenge, I'd really encourage you to get involved in it. Any civil servant can apply to be part of a multidisciplinary team that helps us to tackle some of government's most important challenges through accessing mentoring support and funding around uh, data. And do encourage your non-data specialist colleagues to get involved in that as well, because it's a brilliant opportunity for them to access that support to understand how they can use data and really uh, flex their muscle in that space. So that's what we in CDDO are doing. But what can you do? Uh, I've spoken about some of the tools that are out there to help you, but uh, there, are, there are three questions that I'd encourage you as individuals to reflect on as you shape your one big thing learning plan. Do you understand the, validity of the value of good quality data, support ethical data practices, and know how to mitigate bias in decision making? Can you demonstrate the use of data in evidence-based decision making in your teams using techniques for analysis and interpretation? And do you uphold data standards and ensure data protection best practice and regulations are followed? And do your teams, leaders and colleagues as well, and how can you help them uh, to reach that same level of understanding? You can jump on civil service learning to explore answers to those questions, of course. Talk to your local chief data officer as part of the DDAP function. Uh, head to gov.uk and, and download some of those tools and the guard, guidelines and, and frameworks that support them. Um, but more importantly, beyond one big thing, stay curious and, and keep your skills current. And if I can indulge my inner data nerd for a moment, I want to share with you some of the exciting things that I think are not too far away from government, uh, for government that we should be actively thinking about uh, as part of the data and the analysis functions. AI, as we all know, technology fu fueled by data, is revolutionizing how we live our lives day to day. But more importantly, AI is growing, is, is, is strengthening every day. Generative AI, for instance, doubles in strength every 59 days. Every 59 days, it's extraordinary. Moore's law is totally out of the window. So we need to be thinking about the implications of AI getting stronger and stronger. Secondly, virtual and augmented reality environments are using data to, to augment and visualize the world around us and may very well become more commonplace in years to come. Wearable technologies and embedded virtual assistants are collecting data in new and different ways, powered and may very well in the future be powered by different nanotechnologies that are creating new materials, sensors, and devices, which have really interesting implications on us in government from a policy and a service delivery perspective. And quantum computing may very well, and I, I believe it fundamentally will, one day provide us with unprecedented processing power to send, compute, and receive data in the quantum state. Now, some of these things you may think feel a very long way away. And I would, I would guess that about a year ago uh, from today, you similarly thought that generative AI felt a very long way away. And I think that it's really important to reflect on some of these technologies and the speed with which they can become realities and think about the implications for government, which I believe are huge opportunities and very exciting. But whatever the digital future has in store, uh, one thing is absolutely crucial, that we understand the important role that, digital, that data plays, not just in analysis, but also in service delivery as the lifeblood of our services, and that we can all use data safely, securely, and responsibly to deliver better policy, better services, and also better experiences for our teams. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and you find it a really <laughs> valuable learning experience. Thank you.